Tonight we're having our 48th lesson in the letter to the Ephesians. We'll be in the 4th chapter and the 12th verse tonight. Now this particular passage of Scripture tells us that Jesus, having ascended triumphantly into heaven, taking captive what had captivated men and receiving a kingdom, yeah. as Daniel foretold, being seated at the right hand of God of the majesty in the heavens with all power in heaven and earth given to him, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him, that he forthwith gave gifts to men. <clears throat> See, that's how Jesus thinks, giving gifts to men. Yes, this is not how the kings of the earth think. This is how our Lord thinks. Now, these gifts were just not like uh, gratuities <laughs> that were dispensed because he loved us and so forth. These gifts were serving God's eternal purpose. They were things that were necessary for God to fulfill what he had intended to do. They had very much to do with those that were chosen and those that were predestinated. To these had to do with those. Had to do with redeeming these chosen ones and giving them the Holy Spirit and accepting them into the household of God. This had to do with why Paul prayed that the eyes of their understanding be enlightened and why he prayed that Christ dwell in their heart by faith. It's all connected with those with those things. The main work wasn't to free them from the grasp of the devil that was involved. That wasn't the main work. The main work was to prepare them to be married to Christ. That was, <laughs> that was the main work. And they relate to them being God's children without God being ashamed to call them his children. Because we had the same father as Jesus had. Jesus, God's purpose was not just to forgive our sins, although that was necessary but as to make us the righteousness of God. Yeah. See, that was, the, that was the objective. It was to bring the sons home to glory and conform them to the image of Christ. This is God's purpose. I say this because this is kind of lost in our yeah. day, this perspective. So he gave these gifts to ensure what we just talked about happened. Yeah. Yeah. That's what these gifts are all about. There's no substitute for them. There's no alternative to them. You can't do without them. Amen. The body of Christ needs them. As long as the world stands, these gifts will never become obsolete. They'll never be allowed to be in the background in God's working. So ever you find them in the background, God's not working. Yeah. And not for good, at any rate. He may be sending a strong delusion. I understand that. But he's not working to bless people where these gifts are not up in front. And I say that with no respect at all for institutions that pretend that they're related to God, but it's increasingly evident and glaringly evident that they're not. I don't like them. I don't feel sorry for them. I pray God will take them away. Amen. That's just the way I feel about it. Because I myself have uh, been set back some. Amen. Took me some years to kind of recover from what they had. And I'm sure some of you are in the same status. Now the work of the Holy Spirit, which a lot of people are fond to talk about, the work of the Holy Spirit is circumscri circumscribed or confined to the ministry of these gifts. 
These gifts are like a border within which the Holy Spirit works. You get you you put these gifts out to the background, and the Holy Spirit he That's it. He's not going to work for good. He's not, he's not going to conform people. not going to change people. If these ministries are in the background, the change work of the Holy Spirit is not going to happen. Amen. This is the framework in which he does his work. And these are appointed. These are just not appointed gifts. They're needed gifts. It's just not a kind of a hierarchy that's been established. It's, these are needed. They have to be there. It's not that the work of Christ is insufficient. It isn't that what Jesus does is insufficient, so we need an additional something to be done. It's that this is the appointed means Jesus uses to pour his fullness into his people. This is how he does it, because he cannot do it directly. There's too big of a gap between men and God. So there has to be some kind of a means to adapt to our present condition in the world, in the body. God's not in a body. He is, this is how he's addressed the situation, which aside from what he did, it'd be impossible to be conformed to the image of God's Son. It, this work couldn't get done if it was just God and us. That's right. yeah. Too big a gap. Now, you will see confirmed as we deal with this that this what I call a Babylonish monster that Satan has fabricated doesn't make a place for these gifts. That's why they're not there. Yeah. There's no way you can get these gifts into Babylon. Yeah. That's not who he gave them to. So if you were to pray a Babylonish assembly, and you were to ask God to send them apostles and prophets and evangelists, but he'd say, no, because I'm going to bring that thing down. Yeah. What I'm giving these, I'm giving these gifts to people I'm not bringing down. Yeah. I'm yeah. bringing them up. Uh -huh. Not done. I'm establishing them. Not destroying them like I am going to do Babylon. See, th yeah. now this kind of simplifies things. Kind of simplifies things for us. All right, here's the text. Remember this follows, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. All right, these are what these gifts now, apostles, prophets, evangelists, Pastors, teachers, this is what these gifts are calculated to do. Yeah. So if this isn't being done, yeah. guess who's not there? Yeah. Amen. This is what they do. They're not just glamorous positions to elevate individuals. That's not what they're for. They're not basically authoritative gifts like bosses. That's they do have authority, but it's, it's not authority over people. It's authority to give what God has provided. There's a difference. Yeah. Why is it that some ministers never feed the sheep? Have you ever thought about that? It's because they haven't been given authority to do so. Yeah, right. They're imposters. That's why. Kind of a hard saying, but that's the way it is. Now, to show that this is not just an authoritative office, someone to run the show, so to speak. You've already got someone running the show. We don't need anybody else running the show. Yeah, that's right. Jesus said to his disciples, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not. I remember these are the apostles. We're talking yeah. to the apostles here. It shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. 
Whosoever be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, now, in the words that we're going to read now, Paul begins to expound minister, what that means. For the perfecting of the saints. Now, this reads differently in some of the versions. They, they just kind of provide different aspects of what the word is. Equipping, one version says. Training, another one says. Knit together. That's, that's kind of an interesting. Gathering together. Fully to equip. In other words, they're going to do something, so you're outfitting them to do giving them the tools of the trade, so to speak. Readying and perfecting and full equipping. Now this word perfecting, if you were to think of the literal meaning of it, it, it means to complete furnishing. If you were to uh, perfect a carpenter, with this in, in mind, you would give him a complete set of tools to do whatever he was going to do. It also means adequacy or full qualification or maturity. So again, you're, you're talking about a carpenter, you would make sure he is trained in all of the aspects of carpentry so that he knew how to work with wood and what to do with wood and he could be creative with it and when he was able to do it then he'd be mature or fully equipped or perfected see or made complete that is whatever you need to do need to have Whatever these apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers needed to have to do their ministry, they got everything they needed to actually do what they are supposed to do. See, there's a lot of people trying to do God's work. They're not equipped to do God's work. That's why they can't do it. They're not ready. Now, some of these people are legitimate children of God, but they're just not prepared yet. And if they're in a place where the ministry of these gifts is not accented and not provided, it would be a long time, if ever, that they are ever qualified to do anything because they're not perfected or equipped. Now, when we say perfect, this would be like a child becoming a man. <laughs> it would be like a structure becoming a habitation. Or it'd be like a tree or a vineyard bearing fruit. Jeez, that's, that's the idea of maturity. You, there's a purpose for this, and it, these gifts make it happen. Now, every, uh, every agricultural person knows that if crops that are not attended don't yield. I mean, everybody, you don't have to tell a vineyard keeper this. Now, if you don't take care of this vine, I mean, they, they understand. You see what a sin it is not to take care of the house of God? Yes, it defies even human reasoning. Yes, right. It steps beneath the ignorance of humanity. Amen. It's that low. That low down. Even the devil cultures his people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they sin easier and more completely. Mm -hmm. Yet you've got people that say they belong to God and say they represent God and there's inadequate and unprepared and untaught people sitting up under them year after year after year. Oh, it's a travesty. It's all going to be straightened down the day of judgment. Believe me. <laughs> there are multitudes of professing Christians that have been left to grow up for themselves. But I'm going, to, I'm going to teach in this lesson that this is not possible. You can't grow up by yourself. Yeah. Why? It isn't because you're too weak and so that's not why. It's because this isn't the way God's ordained it. Yes, 
right. Even if you're an apostle, Jesus has got to teach you. <laughs> Even if you're on the Isle of Patmos, you can't figure things out. You've got to get a vision from heaven. You've got to be taught. You have to be trained. That's the way it is. So the people of God left to themselves do not just grow up. That's not what happens. I want to really do my best to make this clear. At the Lord has placed the members in the body as it had pleased him. But they have to have this ministry of the gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, to do what they've been appointed to do. They've got to have that. That's the means God has appointed. Yeah. Because God doesn't deal with each one of us one-on-one. -on -one. That's not the way he does it. He dispenses it to key people in the body of Christ. Apostles are some key people. Then they distribute it to the... That ensures that people will get it. See, if all we, we, we gathered here together, and while we were here, God would thunder out of heaven, give us the lesson for the day. Huh? Everybody would understand it differently. It wouldn't come across like it does when it's funneled through one of our own members. See, it wouldn't come across. Some people say, boy, it really thundered loud today. Some people say, my baby was an angel. Maybe that was an angel. So what I'm saying is it's very difficult for one person on their own to decipher, is it God or is it man? It's very difficult to decipher this. You've had trouble in this area, if you would admit it. You've had trouble in this area figuring out what, what you should do or what feelings are legitimate or is difficult to do. So this arrangement that God has given of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers reduces that liability. It gives you another source, you might say. Now, of course, some people say, well, we've got to teach God's people to feed themselves. And some people think that that's a very wise saying, and once in a while I hear people say that to me. That's what the trouble is. The church has to teach the people to feed themselves. Here's what they forget. That God just doesn't expect fruit. He expects much fruit. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear forth much fruit. So God just isn't interested in something. You producing something. Men may be uh, satisfied with that, but God's not satisfied with that. Yeah. That you might produce much fruit, Jesus, and that your fruit remain. That's another. <laughs> That's another thing we don't want. A lot of people's fruit dries up on the vine, you know. Now we learn that perfecting or maturing or repairing or readying is accomplished by an appointed means, by gifts. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Spiritual adulthood doesn't have to do with what you know. That's involved. But it has to do with what you do. God is people, God grows up people to do something, not just to know Amen. something. They're a part of the edifying process. Each person is a part of that edifying process. For the people of God, let's put it more clear. The people of God need the regular input of the foundation layers of the church, the apostles. They, they, they this has got to be something that is continually refortified. They need their doctrine. They need their exposition of Christ. They need their knowledge of the purpose of salvation. See, they, on a regular, I'm talking about regular in basis. What God has determined for the church is it's based on their sound doctrine. They need the input of prophets regularly. Now, when I say they need the input, I don't mean at some time. I mean all the time, they need the input of the prophets who have insight into the purpose of God. They understand the scriptures. They can put things together. 
These people will speak on the edification, exhortation, comfort. And this is a regular. This regularly has to be regularly being done, not seasonally. Regularly being. This is the way it's set up, so to speak. The people of God need the ministry of evangelists who know the core message and can bring it to bear on whatever we're talking about. Go up, they can bring the gospel of Christ in and associate it with that gospel and tie it all together. They know what the critical time is to say, and that pertains to Christ. So they know the critical time to say that and make these associations. Rather than some saying, yes, and we all better be doing that. And that may be true. Maybe the exhorter said that. But some guy, somebody's got to make the connection with duty and gospel. Some, that's what the evangelist, that's what he does. They need that regular input, and they need the regular care, someone who cares for the flock and knows what they need. These kind of people have to be there, part of it. When these ministry, if these, when these ministries are not taking place, it's pointless to expect the people to grow because that's the means yeah, that's right. by which they grow. Amen. So if the people aren't subjected to the doctrine of the apostles, they don't hear pr prophets who are able to exhort, or able to edify and exhort and, 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 this, this, and this sort of thing, if they don't regularly hear these, the gospel shined up, the jewel of redemption shined up, so it seemed more clearly, they cannot grow. Amen. That's what I'm affirming here. They don't automatically advance. Yes, Sister Barbara. I was also thinking about this, that the, the truth that the people of God grow insists on the fact that they get these things in greater portions as they do grow, and not just the continual uh, feeding of the same amount over and over and over again, but as you continue to receive these things, yeah. there's a greater amount ministered as you grow. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, well, you and it, and it uh, enemy is... Uh, try to throw a monkey wrench in this. You know, I was trying to think back and all the times I've heard about the gifts and it very rarely have I ever heard it connected with these things. Yeah. It's always with, actually, it's, uh, actually they're speaking more of the fruit of the Spirit rather than these gifts. Yeah. They say we ought to love one another more. We ought to have more unity. Mm -hmm. yeah, but that, they don't, are not talking about these things. No. You can see that this is okay. very, very critical matter. Amen. See, you, you don't grow up or bear fruit automatically. Now, I've, I've heard people say this. If it's a real fruit tree, in due time, it'll bear fruit. Yeah. Well, what, what if there's a blight? Yeah, yeah. What if somebody cuts it down? Yeah. This isn't so. See, this isn't true. The people of God just don't. Once you're in the growing process, you just... You'd be amazed how many people think this is the, this is the way it is. Just leave them alone and do time they'll mature. No, that's not the way God has ordained this. He hasn't taken each person and set them out in the desert by themselves and then he causes it to rain on that little spot and that's not the way it works. Spiritual life does not automatically advance. There are certain things that are required like pruning. Like chastening. Like strengthening, like exhorting, like comforting. Now you may be able to do a measure of this yourself, but you run out pretty quick. Now it isn't because you don't have much, it's because this isn't the way it works. Amen. This isn't the way people grow up. People don't grow up just by staying home, studying their Bible, doing a lot of praying. That will, There's some benefit from that. I don't take that away from this, but this is not the ordained means of maturing. If you want to mature, you've got to get under the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers. This You have to be exposed in some way to this. Now, I do understand that all of these, there's literature that has all of this too. I understand that. <laughs> what a truth to see. There's armor to put on. There's resistance to be done. It's all part of maturing now. 
It, this isn't just a duty. This isn't just a duty. Put on the armor because you're supposed to put it on. You've got to do it to survive. You've got to do it to grow. You've got to do it to advance and to have fruit. And some God's put people in the church to remind you of that. So you never forget that. You've got to run. You've got to keep on running. You can't quit running. There's some exhorters that say, run, brethren, run for the prize. Run to obtain the prize. See, there's people he's put in the church to remind us of this. And there's fighting, good fight of faith and wrestling. So it's true, these do require the involvement of the believer, I understand. But the effort will not be expended unless the people have been perfected or outfitted or made ready to do the work. For the perfecting of the saints. Now we've got a limitation here. The saints. God's people, one version reads. Holy ones, another. Holy people. Consecrated people. The word saints means holy ones, blameless and consecrated. God's not going to perfect anybody else. God is not perfecting unholy people. <laughs> this flies right in the face of the modern concept of the church. It directly contradicts what people are taught. They're taught the church is fundamentally a hospital for sick people. No, it's a place where sick people lose their sickness and become perfect. It's not a rehabilitation center. The church is not a rehabilitation center. It's a perfecting center. It's a maturing center. And if the maturing and perfecting is not taking place, whatever that place is, it's not a church. God's not perfecting carnal people. It's holy people. His saints. He's perfecting his saints. So if a person is not a saint, if they're not holy, they're out of the process. God doesn't have anything for them. Except giving them repentance and acknowledging the truth. Didn't you see that? Mm -hmm. Great truth to see. Mm -hmm. It's no wonder Peter said, As he which hath called you is holy, be ye also holy in all manner of conversation. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's why he said that. He knows if you don't do that, you're out of the process. Don't yeah. think you're going to grow if you're not holy. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, unholy people, they tend to get worse. Yeah. Not better. You've seen it happen. We've seen this happen. We can name names. We've seen this happen. The downward trek to unholiness began. It got worse, 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 right? Because God doesn't perfect unholy people. <laughs> but He does holy people. They're perfected by apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's what they're for. What a marvelous arrangement. Well, why does he perfect it? Was the perfection of the maturity and end of itself? There you are, you finally grew up. No. It's for the work of the ministry. So spiritual adulthood is not an end of itself. It qualifies the people to do, do something. Something pertaining to the body of Christ. Not like a private agenda they're working on. Yeah. It's the body of Christ. Ultimately, this ministry has to do with preparing the church to be inhabited by God. Uh -huh. Or from another point of view, to prepare the church to be married to Jesus. Because yeah. Jesus is not going to have an unholy bride. Right. And if you leave this world unholy, you like stay unholy. He that's unholy, let him be unholy still. See, so that's the way it works. You got, you got a life. You got your life on earth is the bore, is the time in which you got to become holy. If you become holy, then God provided for your perfection. If you don't become holy, there's no way you could be qualified to go to heaven. You got to get out of that category and as quickly as possible. See, I don't think these things are generally known, brother. 
In fact, if, if God could take unholy people to heaven, then like what exactly is the need for Jesus? Why, yeah, right. why did we need Jesus if this is the case? Why does a person have to be born again if this is the case? Why is salvation through a name if this is the case? See, this is not the case at all. So these days the church has adopted the jargon of the world, I hate this word, but dysfunctional. The psychiatrist cooked this up, my goodness, the church has picked up on it and it just throws it out like it's a bad word, dysfunctional. So what does that mean, dysfunctional? So he was, I came from a dysfunctional family. Well, we all probably did. <laughs> dysfunctional means impaired. This is a human word now. I'm defining a human word. Impaired, abnormal functioning, unhealthy, unhealthy interpersonal behavior. So the world thinks that a dysfunctional family is still a family. It's just a dysfunctional family. <laughs> and a dysfunctional person, he's still really a legitimate person. A dysfunctional Christian is still a Christian. They're just impaired. <laughs> impaired? God's workmanship is impaired? The new creation is not functional? No, this is, this is completely erroneous. In the world, dysfunctional may be an acceptable term, but it is not in the church. A dysfunctional church is just taken out. Right. It's warned. God in his grace warns them. Do the first works. Better straighten this out. Yeah, I'm going to remove your candlestick if you don't. That is, you won't be a church anymore. A tree or a vine that doesn't bear fruit is useless. Mm -hmm. That's right. It may have aesthetic purposes in the world and provide shade and look nice, and, but God doesn't have trees like this. Yeah. That's not what they're for. Faith that doesn't have works is dead. Yes, amen. Not functional. <laughs> See, it's, I'm commenting on this dysfunctional or impaired or not adequate or not prepared. Yeah. There's no purpose for, the, for it at all. Brethren, who do not love the brethren are not brethren. That's what John said. Yes. He said they, they haven't seen God or known God. They don't even know what it's all about. Yeah. Those who are, insist on touching the unclean thing when God says not to, God won't own them. He said, touch not the unclean thing, and then I'll receive you. Yes. As you're speaking, and this image in my mind, that this is, this is God in Christ building the body of Christ. Now, the point is to see the Father by seeing the Son. Yes. Yeah. Right? By this means, by this exercise of gifts, he is knitting the body together yeah. in love. Amen. And so that it's not, uh, there's, it's developing uh, in our understanding and in our experience the reality of our connectedness because we are children of God. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we have relation to one another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's by that, but this, in this work of the ministry, um, this is to do the work of God together, but it's it's a group. That's it, right. It, I mean, mm -hmm. it, every every member operates according to the to the grace and the measure and the gift of God, but it's still all moving together. Amen. It's not mm -hmm. you're doing that work and they're doing that work, and where this is our emphasis here. Mm -hmm. No, it is the body of Christ that's, right. that's, Amen. that's moving forward together that's right. and consequently it's growing together amen. also amen this this process you're talking about is so effective that in the end god's actually going to be advantaged by the church that's right i mean he and that, yeah. now that it's almost too great to even yeah. think about that god uh, god doesn't need anything and yet at the same time look at what he's done to where in the end he can say 
I'll, I'll be pleased to, to live in you. That's, right. That's how perfect this, this process has done, how accurately it's Amen. matured him to where God will say, I'm moving in. Yeah, and he's going to work. He's yeah. going to express himself mm -hmm. through this. Yeah. Through this. <clears throat> Amen. See, so if he's got some creative work to do. <laughs> yeah. See that? So it's going to be that God is a prodigious worker. Amen. Salvation is just like one of his enterprises that he's revealed. This is a work that's, that seems to be specifically designed mm -hmm. to make who and what, who God is and what he's doing it, evident. Yeah, that's, uh -huh. that's right. That's right. You got it. Amen. Mm, amen. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Uh -huh. See? It's what he said. That when... If the church ever comes together, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> the world will believe. That's right. Yeah. If it doesn't come together, it's just a dream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, with that in mind, it's ridiculous for the church to be doing anything but uh, giving full attention to Christ and to be busy about the Lord's work. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 See, in the world, something that's dysfunctional gives certain experts a job. Yeah. yeah. If the church ever took advantage of what it has in Christ Jesus, there are multitudes of people that'd be out of work. Yeah, that's right. Overnight. Because yeah. they're specialists in dysfunction. Yeah. <laughs> but God is specialist in perfection. Yes, amen. So that's where you got to throw your attention. Where where he's a specialist, that's where you got to throw your attention. Now we're not, mind you, we're not trying to like exclude as many people as we can. Jesus said, you know, if you don't let me wash you, you have no part, no part, no part. Yeah. That's what he said of me, John thirteen eight. <coughs> but we're trying to point out that the. Church of our day has grown accustomed to glaring deficiencies yeah. when there really is no valid reason for them existing because God has given, Jesus has given gifts to the church. Yeah. So it will not be deficient, but will be perfected or matured. Now when God made a provision, when God makes, makes a provision, Men are to avail themselves of it, and it's considered rebellion if they do not. If he gives us the whole armor of God, our role, put it on. Yeah. All right, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, will leave you with this conclusion. i got to put this on. Yeah, that's right. They'll come at it from different, different angles, but you'll, you'll feel uncomfortable if you haven't put this on. Yeah. Put on. Put on the whole armor of God. Put it on. If he gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness, then it's rebellion not to take, not to take, obtain them. Yeah, that's right. So you got the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. See, there from different perspectives they're coming to this. So you know, I got I, everything's there, and it just, it just remains for me to obtain it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're left with that conclusion. But if you're in a Babylonian church, you're not left with that conclusion. There's not pressure, so to speak, put on you to take advantage of what God's given that is thoroughly adequate for what he intends. Amen. Oh, what a truth. If the, Holy, if the grace has been given to us to teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in his present world, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ, if that's, if that's true then I better not have anything that stifles grace or inhibits grace yeah. from teaching me to do those things. And if people aren't doing this, professed Christians I'm talking about, if professed Christians are not denying ungodliness, really lust, and if they're not living righteously and godly and soberly in the world, and if they're not looking forward to the coming of Christ, grace is not teaching them. Yeah. Uh -huh. And if grace is not teaching them, it's because they're not teachable. See? Mm -hmm. See the need for the apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers? Now he's made them, these are there for the work, I say the work, <laughs> the 
the work of the ministry. That's, that's not a verb. It's a noun. Work is a noun. A synonym for it would be business or employment or what somebody undertakes or an enterprise. That's the work. The work. There's a work or a, a task mm -hmm. called ministry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now the gifts are covered in apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They're designed for this work, uh -huh. this enterprise, which from one point is perfection. Mm -hmm. He's going to develop it from another as being able to contribute to the rest of the body. Yeah. That's that's the work. That's what we've been called to. Now some people say the work is winning the lost. This is how I was brought up. The work is winning the lost. Oh, that's not the work. Amen. Amen. It's involved in the work, but it's not the work. Yeah. Amen. The work is get the bride ready. Amen. That's the work. Get people ready to die. Because whatever state they are in when they die, that's fixed. Yeah. Holy still, unholy still, whatever the state is when you leave, that's, that's it. So you want to leave in a good condition. Amen. So these gifts covered in verse 11 are designed to get all the parts of the body involved in the work. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like it. The work now. These there's a variety of different gifts spelled out. These are the primary. Mm -hmm. These are the primary gifts. These are at the head of the list: apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So let me name some of these gifts that that are challenged by these higher mm -hmm. gifts. The Book of Romans mentions prophecy, mm -hmm. ministry, teaching, or serving. Teaching, exhorting, giving, ruling, showing mercy. That's Romans 12, 6 through 8. That's the gift it mentions. Corinthians, it mentions the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, diverse kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, apostles, prophets, teachers, helps, and governments. The Ephesian letter mentions apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Peter lists speaking, saying that it ministry and ministering, and says it involves being a good steward of the manifold grace of God and the ability which God giveth. All right, now there's 21 different gifts are mentioned there that I just read off. No, not it, some of them are duplicated. I'm not counting the duplicates. Twenty-one different mm -hmm. abilities that God gives. Twenty-one different dispensations of grace that are placed in the body of Christ. I don't think any one church ever was planned to have all of them. I think the reason they differ in Rome, Romans, Corinthians, Ephesians, and Peter is they it's listed the ones they had. And Corinth had a lot of them. 21 different gifts, all of which need apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers to awaken them, make people competent to do them, give people some kind of a means to identify where they, where they are in this process. And to function acceptably before the Lord and for the benefit of the body. Now that's the work, the work. That's the work of ministry <laughs> or service. Some versions say works of service, work of ministry. The idea here is that of is not that of meeting a perceived need, but of serving divine interests. Yeah. That's that's the service. The service isn't, oh, I see you need this, so I'm going to serve you in that capacity. No, no. It's what God is doing, an aspect of what God is doing is served by member A and member B. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, Brother Ricky. You notice how backwards this whole
thing is to the world? <laughs> yeah, no, I know. The more you grow up in the world, the less you work until finally you retire and do nothing. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. But in the kingdom, as you as you grow up, you get more active. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're exactly right. Yeah. No wonder they said he turned the world upside down. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> ministry. Now, Jesus, he's a minister. Yeah. He's called a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. He's also called a minister of the sanctuary or the true tabernacle. So Jesus is a minister. Yeah. When he was on earth, he said, I came to minister. I'm a minister. Mm -hmm. I'm serving. God's interest, yeah. which is, benefits the people. The glorified Christ told Saul of Tarsus, I appeared to you to make thee a minister. Yeah. <laughs> Here you are. <laughs> I like the sound of it. Paul says he was made a minister. A servant is one who serves the interests of another. In this case, the interests and purposes of God, not men. As depicted here, the servant is one who, min who ministers, is receiving something from God and giving it to the people. Amen. That's what a minister is. Got something from God, give it to the people. Every member of the body of Christ has been given something to deliver. It's important to see that. Yeah. And they're not to say, well, because I'm not the I, I'm not part of the body. You know, one is to reason that way. Or no one else to say, we have no need of thee. Yeah. The I can't say to the ear, I don't need you. We're a part of the I ministry. We don't need a little toll unless you're walking. Huh? Yeah. See, some people, their ministry is to people that are making progress, they're walking. Yeah. Huh? Now all of a sudden, a big toe, you know, a little toe, oh, yeah, all of a sudden, they, all of a sudden, the knees are important. Yeah. And see, it depends on where the church is going. That's if the church is walking, there's some gifts that are needed That's right. Amen. to not have to walk painfully, you might say. Yes, Sister Melissa? Um, especially in the different brothers that get up and preach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I recognize in each one of them different times of ministry mm -hmm. that they have in the parts of the body, you know, that, mm -hmm. like you said, maybe part of the body's walking at that time, yeah. and, and this mm -hmm. part over here may be running or whatever. Mm -hmm. But each one has a different type of ministry Amen. in that aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Because the work doesn't happen automatically. Yeah. See, that's why the work has to be nurtured. This is the way salvation is devised. The one who's saved has to be nurtured all the way through the world Amen. from beginning to end. Yeah. He has to be admonished all the way to the end. He has to be comforted all the way in. He has to be edified all the way. In. That's the way it's set up. Uh -huh. yeah. I can see why it's this way because otherwise salvation wouldn't make you dependent on God. Yeah. So the Lord has not made himself dispensable. Mm -hmm. He hasn't required anything of people that he's not necessary to the accomplishment of it. Amen. Amen. These things have to be uh... <coughs> lived out. Salvation has to be lived out. It has mm -hmm. to be worked out and uh, gotten out. And men have to be involved in this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, because we, we, it's not something you just you just do. That's yeah. right. Now, I've got to be careful how I say this. There are some people that have a lively sense of the of their need of the assembly and the brethren and the gifts. Mm -hmm. So whenever they're at all able to, they'll be here. Mm -hmm. There's other people that don't see it that way. So frankly, it's fairly easy for them not to be present. Why? This is what they don't see. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. This is what they don't see. They're taking salvation for granted. They think that they're part of a process that just kind of rolls downhill all the way. But see, that here's the failure. We're not going downhill. Yeah, right. We're going uphill. Yeah. And nothing rolls uphill. Yeah, right. yeah. It has to be pushed uphill mm -hmm. or pulled uphill. And, we, and we've got both influences. Amen. we got heaven pulling uh -huh. and the gifts are pushing. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Oh, it's marvelous to see. Amen. Some of those members that may seem insignificant to men, 
yeah. may be the very thing that stabilizes yeah. the stronger ones Amen. to be able to see more. Amen. See, flesh will reason this way. There's nothing in the Bible that says I have to. This is how flesh reasons. And this is true. But it does say that if you're not holy, God won't receive you. It does say that. And it does say if you're not bearing fruit, God will cut you off. It does say that. Amen. And it does say that if you let sin, if you yield to sin, it'll bring forth death in you. It does say that. Yeah. See, here's the situation. We are in an environment that's pulling us down. So there has to be some compensating ministry that helps us to go against that downward that's right. pull and go upward. Now, if, this, if this is right, every member in the body of Christ has something to deliver, then if I stay home, <laughs> how am I going to deliver it? Yes, I mean, it, it, this is just logical reasoning, yeah. wouldn't you say? I mean, it, so, what do you say, you say to Esther? Yeah. He'll you know, raise up somebody else? Yeah, but. But, <laughs> there's that. There's that complication for you if you don't. That's right. <laughs> And you will not keep. See, God won't let you keep what you don't use. Yeah. For the work of the ministry, now notice how this progresses. Four, four, four. Gave the gifts for the perfecting of the saints. He's perfecting the saints for the work of the ministry. Yeah. And he's the work of the ministry is for the edifying of the body. See how it See how it progresses right along. Jesus gave gifts to the church in order to perfect and mature the members of the body because that maturity was in order that they might do what, what, what we're going to read about now. This would indicate that true edification is not accomplished by those who are immature. I don't know how you I don't know how you'd contradict that. Now a word here. We we appreciate the interest of our children yeah. and count a great treasure. But our children don't really edify us. They can comfort us, they can't build you up. Because nobody can take you higher than they are themselves. Yeah. That's what edified. A person who edifies is taking the people up where, where they are. I, 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 you can't assign edification to like anything that sounds good or anything that makes you happy or you're glad to see it. That doesn't mean you've been edified. Being edified means you've been fortified and strengthened and see clearer and this sort of thing. As I've said, a believer cannot lift another believer higher than his own status. So if a person doesn't see much, they can't make you see more. <laughs> it's, it's the way it is. That this, this doesn't eliminate the need for these people. This just says the, edify, the edifying factor. That's what we're headed for, the edifying factor. For the edifying, God's made provision now for the edifying. That's where God's going with this. For the word edifying, other versions read building up or built up. Edifying has to do with building up or promoting another person's growth in Christian wisdom, piety, happiness, and holiness. That's a lexical meaning of the word edify. In edification, there's addition and there's strengthening. It happens simultaneously. If you were building a building, you'd add some bricks, then you'd strengthen the whole structure so this addition wouldn't be a weak spot in the wall. Yeah, right. okay. Now in the world, for a season, the weak spot is the vulnerable spot. If we were in this house, have to replace a part of a wall over here, there'd be a certain period of time we'd be vulnerable or to let seasoned or hardened to be a vulnerable place. But see, in the kingdom of God, this. The place of addition is not a vulnerable place. You're added to and strengthened simultaneously. Yeah. 
That's what happens in edification. Now, as I mentioned, this is necessary because in the world we're subject to eroding influences. If a person or a group of persons is not being built up, they are being torn down. That's the alternative now. You can't stay static. If you're in an environment where there's floods, rains, earthquakes, if you're not made stronger, you're going you're gonna to come down. See, people that aren't being built up are losing grace. How much grace can you lose? I don't want to know. I don't want to be in that kind of a status of losing grace. But see, if you're not being built up, that's, that's what's happening. Because you're in a competing arena where the devil's at work and lusts are at work and temptations at work and so forth. Uh, secondly, if you're not being edified, you can't edify. <laughs> if you yourself are dragging the ground, you're not going to be able to all of a sudden God open your mouth and you build up someone. This isn't the way it works at all. Now let's look at this more closely. <clears throat> the means to edify now is the ministry of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now right, let's say that you're in a place the doctrine of the apostles is not being declared. Edification and exhortation and comfort are not being sounded out. Gospel declaration is minimal, if at all, evangelists. And spiritual shepherding and caring is not present. It's just solving the problems of the world. Now where that condition exists, maturity cannot take place. So a person may go to a church like that 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years and never grow up. Why? Because they've excluded the means through which maturity is realized. Yes, yep. Where the doctrine of the apostles is not declared, there is no edification. No wonder then Paul said, let all things be done unto edifies. Yeah, oh, that makes sense now that he said that. Because there's other things that can you can devote yourself to that doesn't build up, and whatever doesn't build up tears down. Yeah. Jesus, in the kingdom of God, it's either or. If you're not built up, you're torn down. If you're not strong, you're weak. If you're not blessed, you're cursed. If you're not comforted, you're in turmoil. See, that's the way it is in the kingdom of God. It's an either or. You're either in the light or in the dark. One or the other. And so that's why these ministries are necessary. Paul also said that uh, he that prophesies is greater than he that speaks in tongues. Unless he interprets, said. He said, and that the church may receive edifying. See? Yeah. <laughs> That's it, but the church may receive edifying. So I will go so far as to say there may be a, a particular facet of the truth that has particularly impressed you but it may not edify the church they may not be where you're at and they may not need what you got you got to see this now this kind of knocks ahead in the favorite passage and this is my favorite text and stuff like this the person who speaks to God's people has to be discerning it doesn't mean you can write down on a piece of paper you know what what ought to be said and that sort of thing, but there's your spirit is very sensitive. Your spirit is very sensitive, and if you live close to the Lord, He'll direct you into certain areas that you would not by nature go there. Even though you love to teach and you love to preach, you love to exhort, you would not naturally go where God sometimes directs you to go. That's because your purpose is to edify the body not to duplicate in them the experience that you've had. Amen. That may be the case sometimes, understand. That may be the case sometimes, but not always. 
And edification, it takes place in the understanding. That's, that's where you're edified. Your feelings, they're not edified. <laughs> and people think they are. They say, oh, the Lord's really with us today. The Lord is with us today. A lot of people fell down under the power today. Oh, more people than you think believe this way. In fact, the majority of Christians believes this way. Fell down under the power. The Holy Ghost slayed us. What happened? I don't know. I said something. What was it? I don't know. Well, does that really classify as edify? No. person says, I have the power. When I lay my hand down you, you fall backward. Someone's got to catch you before you hit your head or you break your, break your skull. Is that, is, that, is that what God is doing? Does that fortify a person? If it does, whenever you have a bad time, you hope you fall down. Yeah. See, this is not, this kind of stuff is not true, and yet it is very popular today to hear things like this. Edification takes place in the realm of understanding, the comprehension, the discernment. Why? Because God has made you in his own image. So you operate through your spiritual rationale. See, God, God does what he wants. He does what he purposes. This is God, and you've been made in that image so that you, this, is, this is how God made you. You operate according to what you comprehend or what you see. Yes. If you think about that, the Lord is preparing our, our minds to, we're going to be in a new glorified body. This body is cursed. That's right. So why would we? Why would the Lord bless <laughs> us through this body? Because right. uh, a lot of what you're talking about was when I first became a believer, I was with um, people that felt. Well, I went to a tent revival where they fell down and was laughing and laughing, and I really felt uneasy about it. But now I look back about it and see it was all flesh. Yeah. It would, why would the Lord do that? It was all flesh. I yeah. mean. What edification came from throwing yourself on the ground and acting just like a, the people, people in the world do when they're drunk? That's right. Now see, if this was the way God blessed people, then Jesus would have been falling down and laughing all the time. Oh, yeah. Amen. Wouldn't he? Oh. He would have been the example you'd look at. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that's not how he conducted himself at all. Did you that and he healed them? <laughs> yeah. That's right. Amen. Yeah, that wasn't a sign of blessing, was it? <laughs> now, where this, uh, where this condition of not knowing the height and breadth and length and depth and the love of Christ that passed on us, where that and ignorance of that continues on for a long period of time then the gifts haven't been working. The work of apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers has not been active in that environment. Or else they were and the people rejected it. That's the other alternative. See, wherever that, that's what they do. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, where they operate without restriction, edification results in everybody that gives heed to them. They advance. You take Apollos, there was a period of time he knew only the baptism of John, but he was a Bible man. He had a lot of understanding. But see, he had to get from some members of the body. <laughs> he had to get some clarification. Yeah. And when he did, he went out and powerfully spoke the word and convinced people. Yeah. Now, who is the person that would dare to neglect the, it says, the edifying of the body, not the neighborhood, the body. Mm -hmm. Not the lost, the body. Mm -hmm. The edifying, we're talking about edifying now. We're not talking about testifying mm -hmm. or preaching the gospel. We're not talking about that to the lost. Edification of the church. Of the church. He's very particular. To the edifying of the church. Because he's given us a snapshot of the conclusion of things. Jesus is going to present the church to himself without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's where he's headed. So he said, apostles, prophets, evangelists, get the folk ready. Get them ready for me to present them to myself. Now, who is the person 
would take the attention away from the church and put it on somebody else. How do you suppose heaven views this? But you may, you may, in your own thinking, you may make allowance for this, but do you really think God does after he's given all power and all authority to the Son, and so the Son uses all power and all authority to give gifts to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, he gives them to the church. Now, wh exactly how do you think heaven reacts when someone tries to take one or more of those gifts and gives it to someone other than the church? Well, you can see uh, how serious it is. Wherever there's a person or group of persons that minimizes apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, there will not be growth. There will not be edification. There will not be perfection because those are the means whereby God accomplishes those things. And this gets better as we go along. Great confidence builder Amen. to know what God is doing. Yes, Brother Ricky. His work is about glorifying God. That's mm -hmm. right. He's given all power to the Son. And Jesus, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Him. Yeah. And He's mm -hmm. the one administrating the whole thing. Because He's glorified mm -hmm. in the process. And I'm, I'm seeing more clearly now in Ephesians 1 why He says He works all things yeah. after the counsel of His own will. That's mm -hmm. right. Because that's the means in which He's glorified. I used to think that what that meant is, and I I suppose there's a part of this where He takes things that aren't in harmony with His will and He, and he, he makes them in harmony with His will so He can work with them. But there are certain things He can't. That's right. Can't do that with. And so right. he's not going to depart from doing his will in order to do it some way some man has cooked up. He's That's right. not going to do that. Because he wouldn't be glorified then. The man would be glorified. The man would be glorified. Of him. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Anyone else tonight? All right. When I was thinking about when I was going through um, the Philippians, how Paul ministered to the, the brethren in Philippi there and then they ministered to him yeah. through they gave him gifts and it was a it was such a great ministry that he contributed he said it was a sweet smelling incense to the Lord the gifts that they gave him it was like I was just thinking about this as you're talking how the body of Christ when you're talking about some people are missing from the services and stuff I mean, the body of Christ, it works together. I mean, yeah. the Lord will send one to minister in one way or another. To, and, but Paul needed the Philippians just as much as they needed him. And for one person to say, well, I'm not really that important. I'm not gonna, I don't need to come to a meeting or whatever it, it be. This, this doesn't make any sense because we all feed off each other. The Lord uses us in different ways to edify and build one another up. Amen. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this revelation of the purpose for apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We're grateful for these provisions. We're grateful for the abundance that we receive through them and how they awaken the various abilities and gifts that you have given to all the members of the body. We grant, Father, that we ask that you grant that we as a congregation would be a great source of joy to you. In Jesus' name, amen.